Take your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter. The Gospel of John, the fifth chapter. We've made our way up to our 19th lesson moving through the Gospel of John. And I'm preaching on Sunday mornings under the title, I Believe. John writes so that we can believe the right things and receive eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now for the last several weeks, we've been camped out here in John chapter 5, one of the lengthy discourses of Jesus. It involves the issue of him healing a paralyzed man. You remember down by the pool of Bethesda, Jesus encountered a man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. He spoke to him, rise, take up your pallet and walk. The man did exactly what Jesus said, but the problem is it was on the Sabbath day, and so there was a theological brouhaha, a little religious dust-up that followed it, and we've been studying that for the last several weeks. Because the healing was on the Sabbath, the religious Jewish leaders were absolutely furious about it, and so they began to persecute Jesus, and they even began to seek a way to put him to death. Jesus began to encounter and respond to their accusation back in verse 17. He makes a claim that the leaders understood very clearly was a claim to equality with God. In the beginning of Jesus' response, he makes it very clear he is equal with God because he is in fact God come in human flesh. And that response was a staggering claim. Listen carefully. It was a staggering claim to stand in mortal human flesh and blood and claim to be God. It was no more acceptable in that day than it would be in our day. I heard about two young psychiatrists who were making their very first rounds through an insane asylum. And as these two young psychiatrists walked down the hallway at the middle institution, they heard a voice calling out, I'm George Washington, I'm George Washington, I'm George Washington. They thought that was interesting. They opened the door and said to the man, and said, "Uh, you're George Washington? He said, yes, first president of the country, uh, commander of the Continental Army. I'm George Washington. And the doctor said, well, why is it you think you're George Washington? He said, because God told me I'm George Washington. At which point his roommate sat up in the bed and said, I said no such thing. It would indeed be lunacy to claim to be God unless that claim is true. You know, there are a lot of claims about Jesus when it comes to his deity, his godness, if you will. Buddhism says, for example, that Jesus was wise and an enlightened teacher, but he was not God, according to the Buddhists. Islam says that Jesus was a good man, indeed a great prophet, but they say he was just a man and not, in fact, God. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that Jesus was not really God, nor was he actually man, but that he was an appearance of the archangel Michael. Mormonism says that Jesus was a created man who became a God, but they would deny that he is the eternal, self-existent creator God of all time and eternity. Unitarianism would teach us that Jesus was a good example, and we ought to walk in his footsteps and pattern our lives after him so we can learn how to show greater compassion to our fellow man. Scientology's founder, L. Ron Hubbard, says he doubts that a historical figure named Jesus Christ ever even existed. Meanwhile, The word of God and the claims of Jesus Christ are radically different from these blasphemous heretical claims of false religious groups. Jesus stood flat-footed, eyeball to eyeball with the religious leaders and made a claim to be God come in human flesh. Now such a claim was blasphemous and worthy of death. The only defense against this charge of blasphemy would be if Jesus could verify that his claim was true. The only defense against the charge of heresy and blasphemy would be if Jesus could prove that he was in fact God. John writes to give us evidence about the person of Jesus Christ. You have learned by now the theme verse of John's gospel. In chapter 20 and verse 31 the apostle said, But these have been written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. And John takes 21 chapters to give evidence that Jesus is who he says he was. But Jesus does not relegate that duty to John the Apostle alone. Listen, here in chapter 5, Jesus puts on quite a defense of his own. He calls a number of witnesses to attest to his claim. And so this morning, I want to speak about witnesses for the defense. Jesus calls some witnesses to defend his own claim that he is indeed God. John chapter 5, beginning in verse 31, would you stand to your feet? We stand here at Emmanuel to show our public reverence for the reading of God's inspired, infallible, and inerrant word. John 5, beginning in verse 31, Jesus said, And uh, 
If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. You have sent to him, and he has testified to the truth. But the testimony which I receive is not from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was the lamp that was burning and was shining, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than the testimony of John, for the works which the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me, and you have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. You do not believe, or you do not have his words abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. and You are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. I do not receive glory from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in yourselves. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses, in whom you've set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? May heaven add a blessing to the reading of God's perfect word as we take our seats this morning. Legal language fills the pages of John's gospel, and this passage is no exception. John regularly writes about witnesses, testifying, testimony, confessions, judgment, and receiving a witness. Here in these verses we find the words testify or testimony appear 11 different times and the words believing or receiving appear 9 times in reference to believing the testimony and receiving the witness that has been given. Here in these verses Jesus is declaring and John is writing down like an inspired stenographer unambiguous evidence that he is in fact God robed in flesh and blood. Now as Jesus calls these witnesses to his own defense, I want you to consider with me three things about these witnesses. Notice with me first of all that these witnesses were recounted by Jesus. In the Bible, Jesus is presented sometimes as a judge. Sometimes he's presented as our advocate or our defense attorney. But here the Savior assumes the role of defendant and defense attorney. Someone has said that a man who acts as his own attorney has a fool for a lawyer. I think that's probably generally good legal advice, but it's not true when the defendant is none other than God himself. And as his own defense attorney, Jesus calls forth a roster of great witnesses. And listen, listen to those who appear on his witness list. There's, there's John the Baptist, there's Moses, there are miracles, there's the Bible. God the Father in Christ even enters testimony himself. Notice this parade of witnesses that Jesus recounts. In verses uh, 31, for example, we see evidence and witness testimony from the Savior. Jesus said in verse 31, If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. Jesus was not apologetic about claiming that he was God. In fact, back in chapter 2, you remember when he cleansed the temple? The Jews should have known that was a claim to his deity. The word deity just means his godness. Jesus was God. The prophet Malachi had predicted that when the Messiah came, he would stand as a refiner in the temple. That he would purge and cleanse the temple. So when Christ cleansed the temple, he was necessarily saying, I am the Messiah. I'm the Son of God, the Son of Man. I'm God come in the flesh. That's in chapter 2. In chapter 3, he spoke to the religious leader Nicodemus. You know John 3, 16. Well, John 3, 17, Jesus said that that God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And Jesus said in John 3, 18, that if you believed on him, you would not have condemnation. But if you do not believe on him, you you are already under condemnation because you've not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Jesus has continually testified about his deity. He did it in chapter 2. He did it in chapter 3. He did it as well in chapter 4, down by Jacob's well. The woman said, I know that when the Messiah comes, he's going to set all things in order and teach us all things. And Jesus said, the one who is speaking to you, I am he. 
And here in chapter 5, Jesus has begun a blistering defense of his claim to be God. Jesus had no bones about testifying to who he was. I heard about a woman who was the victim of a, a purse snatcher. She was called to testify against the man that the police had apprehended. And the prosecutor said, do you see the man that stole your purse in the courtroom? And she pointed over to the defendant's chair and she said, that's him. I'll never forget that face. I'd recognize him anywhere. At which point the dumb defendant rose to his feet and said, that's a lie. I was wearing a mask when I stole that woman's purse. Well, the Lord Jesus did not mask who he was. Yes, he veiled his deity behind a robe of flesh, but at every opportunity he he made claim to the fact that he was God. But Jesus says something that's actually very staggering. I want you to pay attention to it in the 31st verse. Jesus said, if I alone testify about myself, then my testimony is not true. Jesus says, if I were forced to cause you to take my word for it, you could call me a liar. If I didn't have anybody else that would rise up and say, yes, he is God. Jesus says, you've got a right to disbelieve every word that I say. He said, if I alone testify, then my testimony is not true. But the Savior himself called, is called as a witness. Not only the Savior, but we see a second witness that is called, and that is the servant. In verses 32 through 35, which we just read, Jesus gives a clear reference to the prophetic prophesied forerunner, John the Baptist. And he says, John the Baptist testified that I was indeed the Son of God. Now the Jews respected John the Baptist, and here he is described as a light, a lamp. And Jesus said, you rejoice in his truth for a while. That is, up until the point that he, that he was dead, you rejoice in his truth. The Jews revered the ministry of John the Baptist, so much so that, do, do you remember, they actually wondered for a while if he was the Messiah. They sent messengers to him back in chapter 1 and asked him, are you the Christ? He said, I'm not the Christ. They said, then are you Elijah? He said, I'm not Elijah. Are you then that prophet? He said, I'm not that prophet. They said, then who are you? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the pathway of the Lord as said by the prophet Isaiah. Now the Jews who were investigating John and inquiring of him should have known that in Isaiah chapter 40 in our Bibles, the word of God says that prior to the coming of the Son of God, A forerunner would come as a voice crying in the wilderness. And John the Baptist says, that's who I am. He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. The Savior is coming. And the day after he said that, in John chapter 1 verse 29, he saw the Lord Jesus walking and John raised his finger. And do you remember what he said in John 1 29? Behold, there's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This is the one he said that I've been telling you about. I've been telling you one was coming after me that was actually before me and I'm not worthy to stoop down and unlatch the the latchet off of his sandals. This is the Lamb of God that has taken away the sin of the world. And Jesus says, apparently you believe that John would tell you the truth. You sent some folks to to take him under deposition and John told you that I am the Son of God. And so Jesus recounts some of these witnesses. There's the witness of the Savior. There's the witness of the servant. Notice thirdly, there's the witness of the signs. In verse 36, Jesus says something quite astounding. The testimony that I have is greater than the testimony of John for the works the Father has given to me to accomplish. The very works that I do testify about me that the Father has sent me. Jesus says, if you want to know who I am, look at the stuff I do. The stuff I do will tell you a lot about who I am. Uh, For example, if you follow a man around and you see him examining patients, writing prescriptions, performing surgeries, you can reasonably assume that man is a doctor. If you see a man writing lesson plans and standing in front of students, instructing them, grading homework and giving homework assignments, you can reasonably assume that that man is a teacher. If you see a man flipping burgers and frying fries at Burger King, working the drive through you can reasonably assume he's a University of Florida graduate. You can just follow a person around. Watch what they do and figure out some things about them. No, in all seriousness, Jesus is more than willing To let his actions speak as loud, at least, as his words. The Jews should have known 
The evidence was staring them in the face from the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, the the prophet said, When the Messiah comes, the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf will be unstopped, the lame will leap as a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. Jesus said, I'll let my work, the stuff that I do, be an even greater, more reliable witness than the testimony of John the Baptist. Do you remember in Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist was going through a season of doubt and he dispatched two of his own disciples to go ask Jesus this question. Now listen, this was a question on the heart of John the Baptist. Jesus, are you the Messiah or should we look for another? By the way, most Christians go through a season of doubt. Especially if you were raised in church and from your earliest days, you, 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 you've learned the truth of God. Sometimes around high school, maybe college or young adult age, you begin to wonder, do I just believe this because this is what my parents taught me? What if I had been born somewhere else? What if I had been reared in another religion? Is all of this stuff really, really true? I've got good news for you. Even the prophesied John the Baptist had a moment like that in his life. He, he sent some messengers to Jesus. Jesus, are you really the Christ? Are you really the Messiah? Or should we be looking for somebody else? And here's what Jesus said to the disciples of John the Baptist. He said, go back and tell John the Baptist what you've seen me do. Tell John that you've seen me open the eyes of the blind. Tell John that you've seen me loosen the tongue of the mute. Tell John you've witnessed me unstop the ears of the deaf. Tell John that the lame are walking and the lepers are cleansed. Tell John that you've even seen me raise the dead. And John will know that a man that can do that is God robed in human flesh. Jesus says, if you want to know who I am, go ask the blind man. He'll tell you he's he's, he's seen me do a great work in his life. (laughs) Uh, Go ask the one that was dumb and mute and and they'll spend the whole afternoon testifying about the grace that I lavished upon their life. If you you really want to know what I can do, go ask the dumb person. Go ask the one that was deaf and, and they will tell you that my voice was the sweetest voice they've ever heard. In fact, if you want to know who I am, just walk across the temple courtyard and ask that paralyzed man toting his mat, even though it's on the Sabbath. He'll tell you what I can do and the works that I do will testify that I am who I say I am. Jesus calls some witnesses. There's the Savior. There's the servant. There are the signs. Many of you are familiar with that great old hymn, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. Did you know that the Wesleys actually wrote 19 verses to that hymn? Aren't you glad we don't sing all 19 of them? Uh, My favorite verse, of all of them, my favorite verse is actually one that rarely appears in a hymnal. It says, Hear him, ye deaf. His praise, ye dumb. Your loosened tongues employ. Ye blind, behold your Savior come. And leap, ye lame, for joy. Jesus would amen that great hymn text. And he calls his signs to testify. Notice also he calls the witness of the sovereign. God the Father himself enters testimony about Jesus. Look in verse 37. And the Father who sent me, he's testified of me. Now you haven't heard his voice, you haven't seen his form. You don't even have his word abiding in you because you don't believe him who he sent. Jesus says, God the Father has testified about me. I was thinking about when I was growing up, I used to see these bumper stickers all the time that said, let me tell you about my grandchildren. Have you ever seen that tag? I always wonder, what are we supposed to do riding down the interstate at 65 miles an hour? Blow the horn and roll down the window. Tell me about Junior. Evangelist Junior Hill loves to tell the story of a woman who came up to him at a meeting and said, Brother Junior, she she had a photo album, Brother Junior, have I showed you the pictures of my new grandbaby? He said, no ma'am, and I sure am thankful. (laughs) You know, God the Father, though, he enjoyed bragging on his son. In fact, when, when God was announcing the conception of his son, he didn't send out a postcard. He dispatched the angel Gabriel. 
to a virgin named Mary. He dispatched Gabriel to her betrothed husband Joseph to reassure him that this was all in the plan of God. And in fact, when the baby was finally born, he didn't post it on Facebook or tweet out a Twitter picture. He actually sent a multitude of the heavenly hosts and they filled the night sky saying glory to God in the highest. Oh, God was well pleased to brag on his son. But now the testimony that I believe Jesus is referencing didn't happen at his conception, didn't happen at his birth. I believe Jesus is referencing the testimony that the sovereign God entered at Jesus' baptism. In John chapter 1, verses 33 and 34, John the Baptist gave this testimony. He said, the one that sent me to baptize said this, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one. And John said, I myself have seen and I've testified that this one is the Son of God. You remember at the baptism of Jesus? The Bible says when Jesus came up out of the water, which is, by the way, another, another indication that believers' baptism is by immersion only because Jesus was baptized by immersion. After his baptism, he came up out of the water. And do you remember what happened? The Bible says the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descended in the form of a, of a dove and, and stayed upon Jesus Christ. And a voice came booming out of heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I remember when our son Matthew was born, he was born prematurely, and so none of the grandparents were able to get to the hospital in time for his birth. They got there just as quickly as they could, and within just an hour or so after he was born, my parents came into the waiting area there, the labor and delivery floor, and I was able to walk my parents into the nursery. There were several babies that had been born, and they allowed me to take my parents in there where Matthew was in the little crib. And I took them past all those ugly babies. <laughs> I said, this is the one. Daddy, this one's my son. Daddy, this is the one that's your grandbaby. You see, I pointed to my son and I gave evidence of his identity in the nursery over at the Wayne County Hospital. God the Father did it in the murky waters of Jesus' baptism. This one is my son. And Jesus says, you don't have to take my word for it. Ask John the Baptist. Open your eyes and look at the miracles. Listen to the testimony of God the Father himself. Jesus calls one more witness and we read of that testimony in verse 39. He calls the scriptures. Verse 39, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. Jesus says, you, you've got the scroll of some of the great prophets of, the, of what we would call the Old Testament. You've got them right here with you. Guess what? He says, I want to enter all of that as evidence. All of that testifies about me. Jesus calls these scriptures to testify about who he is. By the way, you do understand that all of the Bible is a testimony about Jesus. You, you do understand that the Word of God testifies about Jesus Christ. Jesus is actually a bit dumbfounded. That they've spent their lives searching the Scripture and yet they don't see Him in the text. It would be as if someone took today's bulletin and said, Brother Mike, I've, I've got this bulletin before Sunday school and I've spent all morning studying that bulletin. I've poured my life and my energy over this bulletin. But, but I, I don't see the name of Emmanuel Baptist Church on this bulletin anywhere. Y'all see that? It's right at the front. It's all over it. It's on the front. It's on the back. It's in the middle. How can you say you spent all this time studying the document and you don't see something that is as plain as the nose on your face? This is an indication of what Jesus is telling the Jews. You say you spent your life studying the scriptures looking for the Messiah and yet all of these scriptures are actually testimony about me. How in the world have you missed it? Jesus calls and recounts these witnesses. There's a second thing though that I want you to notice about these witnesses. Not merely that they were recounted by Jesus, but these witnesses were rejected by the Jews. They didn't believe them. At the time, it was called the trial of the century. Toward the close of the 20th century. Hard to believe it's been 20 years since California police were called to that address at Rockingham. Hard to believe it's been 20 years since the double murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. Did you know that June of this year was the 20-year mark? That case was so 
infamous because the defendant was so famous. It was O.J. Simpson in that white Bronco in the low speed chase. Do you remember that? And boy, when they put O.J. on trial for the murder of Nicole and Ron, they brought a mountain of evidence. DNA evidence, fiber evidence, fingerprint evidence, footprint evidence. You remember those Bruno and Molly shoes? Do you all remember what I'm talking about? They had timeline evidence, circumstantial evidence. They had a good motive. He had a history of beating that woman like a rag doll. And yet when it came time to mount his defense, Johnny Cochran, really didn't defend O.J. He prosecuted the LAPD. There were some racist comments by Detective Mark Furman. Are you, are you going down memory lane with me for just a moment? And uh, the community was still in an uproar. They were angry about the, the police beatings of Rodney King. And what happened after the jury was out for a little while, they came back with a verdict of not guilty. And did you know on the 20th anniversary of that case, CNN did a survey... Of all Americans that were of Americans that were adults at the time, and across racial divides, 89 percent of Americans now believe that O.J. Simpson got away with double murder. Now, my point in bringing that up is not to try to retry O.J. Simpson. My point is to tell you that case introduced Americans to something called jury nullification. That is a phrase that is used when legal scholars look at a case and say the evidence was so overwhelming it is obvious the jury had already made up its mind what the verdict was going to be and no amount of evidence would have convinced them otherwise. And here's why. In order for them to examine the evidence they would have to change their mind. They would have to change and they just flat weren't going to change and so you could have brought all the evidence you wanted it would have made no difference. Now... Whether or not that happened historically in the case of O.J. Simpson, only the judgment day is really going to reveal. But I can tell you, theologically, it did happen on this day that Jesus was defending his deity. The Jews had already made up their mind that Jesus was a blasphemer and no amount of evidence was going to convince them otherwise. They had at least three problems that caused them to do that. First of all, I submit that they had a lordship problem. We're working through this text. I've made my way up to verse 40. There Jesus says, you're unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. Now they wanted life. They believed in death and the judgment. They believed in the future resurrection. They believed in the afterlife. They wanted life. Listen to me. But they refused to come to Jesus to do it. They didn't know a lot about this Jesus life, but they knew this much. He was bringing change in all the people he encountered. And if we accept him, we've got to change. And they were not willing to change. They had a lordship problem. Now I'm about to get very, very practical. Are you still in the building this morning? Say amen. We get some insight into their mindset over in John chapter 11. Immediately following the resurrection of Lazarus. John 11, 47 and 48 says, Therefore the chief priests and Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. In other words, the evidence is clear. But if we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. Jesus seems to be who he claims to be. But if we let him go on and do what he's doing, it's going to affect us. We're going to have to get out of our position. We're going to have to be removed from our place. And these Jews back in chapter 5 had the same lordship problem. Look right up here. Let me tell you something. Here's the reason that people in this building this morning will reject Jesus Christ in the face of all the evidence because if he's Lord, then I can't be. If he's Lord, I've got to change and I'm just simply not going to do it. I'll give you a simple example. It was about two weeks ago I received a phone call from a pastor acquaintance and the pastor said to me, I hear you have a vacancy on your staff and I know a good man. I'd like to share his name and resume with you. And I said, oh, I'd love to receive that good recommendation. And he said, well, he's one of the best student ministers in the the state. I said, student minister? We don't have a vacancy for student minister. He said, I thought your student minister just went to Statesboro. I said, no, that was our music minister. He said, oh, 
I said, your resume won't do me any good. The position you're wanting to apply for on behalf of your friend, that position's already filled. Are y'all following what I'm saying? And when Jesus comes along, uh, could I say applying for the position? For most of us, that position is already filled. And in order for Christ to be enthroned, somebody else is going to have to be dethroned. And most of the time, we've got to dethrone self in order for Christ to be exalted and enthroned in our lives. Most of us, we've got a lordship problem. We want the stuff that Jesus can bring. We just don't want Jesus. We want the life, but we don't want the life giver. That position is already taken. The throne is occupied with recreation. The throne is occupied with money. The throne is occupied with pastimes. The throne is occupied with hobbies. The throne is occupied with Pierce County football or Ware County football or Brantley County football or I could go on down the list. The throne is far too often already occupied and so Jesus is applying for a position that in our lives is already filled. And by the way, one way that you can identify what's the, what, who's the God on the throne of my life? Here's a little indication. You get excited when your God is being exalted and you get offended when your God is criticized. Start watching what rings your bell and what ticks you off. And you got a pretty good indication who's on the throne or what's on the throne of your life. These Jews wanted what Jesus had to offer, but they didn't want Jesus. They had a lordship problem. They also had a love problem. In verses 41 and 42, Jesus goes for the jugular and says, I know you. And by the way, he knows knows me and he knows you as well. Jesus said, I know you. You're not fooling me. He says, you don't have the love of the Father in you. It it would be hard to, to fully describe the weight of that statement. Jesus said to folks that had devoted themselves to what they believed to be the worship of God. And Jesus said, you don't love God. The love of God is not in you at all. Now in John's first epistle, the little book of 1 John, there are several references to people who do not have the love of God in them. And it is always a description of a person that's lost. Jesus is looking them eyeball to eyeball and says, here's your problem. You're lost. You've got a love problem. For example, over in Matthew chapter 22 verses 36 through 40. A teacher came and asked Jesus Christ, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind. This, he said, is the greatest commandment. And the second one is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Then Jesus added this statement. On these two depend all the law and the prophets. Jesus said, if you can love God supremely and love others selflessly, if you can do those two things, you'll be able to keep all the other commandments of God. But now if you don't love God and you don't love other people, you're going to violate every commandment. Jesus said all the laws of God hang on these two. The love of God and the love of others. And then he says to these folks who prided themselves as law keepers, you don't have the love of God. And if you don't have that, you're not saved. If you don't have that, not only are you not keeping all of the law, you're not keeping any of the law. He just just goes, goes for the jugular. He says, you've got a love problem. You've got a lordship problem. He tells them, thirdly, you've got a legalism problem. Look in verse 43. Now, this is where many of us live. I want you to pay very close attention. Verse 43, I've come in my Father's name and you don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you don't seek the glory that is from the one and only God? Now, I want you to sit up straight and lean in close. Here's what Jesus is saying to them. He says, you know what your problem is? You're spending all your time trying to impress one another. And you're not putting any focus on trying to impress God. You want the approval of man, but you're not spending near enough time trying to seek the approval of God. Now the reality is I can get your approval in part because you don't follow me around. I can get a measure of your approval and your validation. Oh, he's a godly man. And part of the reason is you don't see me in my unfiltered, unguarded, unseen moments. But the reality is Jesus tells these men, here's your problem. 
You're spending all of your time on the exterior trying to look pleasing to men, but you're not spending any time on the interior desiring to be pleasing to God. He says, you've got a legalism problem. I wonder, is there someone in the building this morning that you're spending all of your time going through the exterior rituals of religion, but your own heart is cold and dead toward God? You know what I've discovered in my own life? Can I be real transparent for just a moment? I've discovered in my own life it's easier for me to deal with the exterior than the interior. It's easier for me, for example, to show up and go to Sunday school than to forgive somebody who sinned against me. It's easier for me at times to write a tithe check than to be a godly father to my children. It's easier to write a check. Are you listening? It's easier to get dressed and come to church than to forgive people who have wronged you. Pray for those that despitefully use you. Love your enemies and die to self on a daily basis. And Jesus says, here's your problem. You have focused all your attention on the legalistic trappings of religion and you've not dealt with the inner man of the heart. And so because of that, they'd already made up their mind. Are you listening? They'd already made up their mind. We're not going to accept, will not trust Jesus. And so these witnesses were recounted by Jesus, but they were rejected by the Jews. But there's one last thing. These witnesses will be recalled in the judgment. Recalled in the judgment. If you've ever watched very many trials, you know sometimes after a witness testifies, the judge may remind them, you're still under oath. Your subpoena is still good. Stay in the courtroom. We, we may call you back as a rebuttal witness. And sure enough, Jesus says, you can reject this evidence today. You can reject the testimony of these witnesses today. But guess what? They're going to be called back to the witness stand again. And in so doing, he makes three very startling claims. Notice in verse 45 what I've entitled a profound revelation. Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who accuses you is Moses. Now the Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren, but here Jesus says very clearly that Moses will be the accuser of these men. John MacArthur says it's difficult to imagine how profoundly shocked and outraged these men must have been by Jesus' statement. In their minds it was utterly incomprehensible to think that Moses, whom they proudly affirmed as their leader and teacher, would one day accuse them before God. They prided themselves that Moses was the person that they were following. I want everyone in the building to stand up for just a moment. I'm not sure why, but I've got more people asleep this morning than probably any Sunday in my ministry. I'm telling the truth. Y'all may stand up for the rest of my sermon. What I'm saying is important. Jesus said, you pride yourself that you're a follower of Moses Then he says, Moses is not going to stand for your defense on the judgment day. Moses, he says, is on my witness list. Moses is the one that's going to accuse you. Be seated if you can stay awake. What a pointed and profound revelation. I don't think that Jesus is primarily talking here about the person of Moses. Listen, he's talking about the prophecies of Moses. Jesus said in John 12 verse 48, He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. And the words which I have spoken, that's what's going to judge him at the last day. Can you imagine Moses there at the great and terrible judgment? And he says to these Jews, listen, who had spent their entire life studying the writings of Moses. And Moses says, what do you mean you didn't see the Messiah? I wrote about him all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. What do you mean you didn't see the Messiah? I wrote about him in Noah's ark. What do you mean you didn't understand that there was a Savior coming? I I pictured him in Abel's sacrifice. What, What do you mean that you didn't know anything about a Messiah? I wrote about him in Abraham. Ram, what do you mean you didn't see the Messiah? I wrote about him with Jacob's ladder. What do you mean you didn't see the Messiah? Acting like you never had any proof, talking like you never had any evidence. I wrote about him in the Passover lamb. I wrote about him in minute detail in all the feasts and festivals, the issues of the Passover and the tabernacle and later the temple worship. What do you mean you didn't know any better? And Jesus says, Moses, that you think is going to help you out is going to stand up and accuse you in the judgment. 
This is a clear indication that the heart, the, the heart of the problem for an unbeliever, listen, the heart of the problem is a problem of the heart. The issue is not that you don't have enough evidence. The issue is you have hardened your heart, stiffened your neck, and refuse to believe the gospel. And Jesus just makes a very profound revelation. The one you're counting on, your ace in the hole, he's on my witness list. The one that's going to accuse you is Moses. Then he says something about a powerless religion. He says, the one that accuses you is Moses, the one in whom you've placed your hope. (laughs) Powerless religion. Moses never wrote anything that would give them hope. Moses never wrote anything that was designed on its face to give them hope. The laws of Moses were not designed to give hope. They were designed to bring despair. They were not designed to bring life. They were designed to bring death. The laws of Moses were not written to tell you how to be saved. The laws of Moses were written to tell you that you could not do that and you needed a Savior. Jesus says you have pointlessly placed your hope and your faith In the writings of Moses, there's a profound revelation, a powerless religion. And then in verses 46 to 47, there's a pointed rebuke. Here Jesus says, if you believe Moses, you would believe me because Moses wrote about me. But if you don't believe his writings, how are you going to believe my words? Jesus is throwing in the towel. Look right up here. He says, I'm resting my case. You're either going to believe the evidence or you're not. There is plenty of evidence. And if you won't believe the evidence I've already presented, no amount of extra evidence is going to do any good. You're either going to believe the evidence already presented or you're not going to. That's really it. And so I say again, the problem in the life of an unbeliever is not a lack of evidence. In fact, John tells us in chapter 20 of this gospel that there's a sufficient amount of evidence right here in the gospel of John alone. And so as we close this morning, I want to ask you, have you believed the evidence? You see, in the American judicial system, there's a, there's a motion, there's a legal maneuver. Listen, listen, sit still and listen. It's called a summary judgment. You know what a summary judgment is? It's when, it's when the evidence is clear, there are really no facts that are in dispute. And so one attorney might make a motion for a summary judgment. Here's what he says. He says, Your Honor, just from the evidence we already agree on, The evidence is clear. The facts are beyond dispute. The outcome is inevitable. Let's don't waste everybody's time with a trial. Go ahead and enter a judgment. And I'm telling you today, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And all those that believe in Him will be saved and forgiven. And all those who reject Him will be eternally damned and lost forever. And the evidence is in. The facts are beyond dispute. And the outcome is unavoidable. And so I'm going to ask you to do something today. Don't waste any more time. Why don't you enter in a summary judgment today and go ahead and cast your lot with the Lord Jesus. Somebody in the building this morning, you need to be saved. And I'm going to ask you, don't waste any more time. Trust Christ as your Lord and Savior today. Somebody in the building, you are a Christian. But you're not walking with God and you keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. The outcome is already determined. It's inevitable. Why don't you just go ahead and make your decision for Christ today. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father... We've heard the evidence. We've listened to your defense of your own son. And I ask you today in the simplicity of this moment, help us do business with you. And we ask that, Lord, for our good and the glory of your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.